Welcome to Manga Mavericks Ad Movies, the show where we talk smack about movies. Is that still our catchphrase? We Lord GTZ. Why haven't we come up with a new one? I don't know. Why haven't you come up with a new one? I don't know. We're just repeating the same old formula again and again. We'll be doing this for 50 years soon enough. But, you know, that's okay. Some franchises can go 50 years with the same formula and keep it fresh, exciting, and entertaining. What franchise do we know of that can do that so well? Better than any other franchise out there, Relord. Um, Sazay-san. Maybe, but you've never seen Sazay-san, so that makes you a big fat phony and a liar. I know it's good, though. Everyone says it's good. If everyone said jumping off a cliff was good, would you do that? Would you jump off a cliff if it I, was good? I don't know. I dabble in it a bit. I... How do you dabble in jumping off a cliff? I don't you know. Commit. You commit. Can, can you, you do it? Are you, you down? You can connect yourself to a bungee cord to try it out. If you, if you like the experience, you go all the way. That's wishy-washy and a completely different thing. In all seriousness, um, Lupin? Yes, we saw the theatrical screening of Lupin the Third, the castle of Cagliostro, celebrating Lupin's 50th anniversary yeah. in general. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. This is the first time this film has been shown in theaters since 1991 in North America. Yep. So that's pretty interesting. And it was never given a widespread theatrical release before. Yeah, it was a film festival, right? It was a, yeah, film festival in New York City. So this is the first time it's getting a widespread country-wide debut in U.S. theaters. And hopefully it does well. The theater we saw it in was kind of dead. Yeah, there was like seven people. There were seven people here, including us. Yeah. So five other guys. They almost forgot to play the movie. They did. They did. Luckily, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't like Ancient Manicus's Bride, where we were waiting like 20 goddamn minutes well, for well, that, that to start. That, that wasn't their fault, though. That, that was wasn't like, the same theater, but you know yeah. what I mean. It wasn't one of the worst experiences we've had. Even that, this. though, they started the thing. It's just that the tape had 20 minutes of those ads, and they... Sure. Yeah. But with know. this, you know, we almost ran into the same problem, because they started <laughs> the Phantom Events, you know... Tape, like the tape yeah. that has this movie on it. You know, it has 30 minutes of pre-show whatever bullshit. Yeah. That has, like, the fat of events guy, like, hyping you up. Apparently, <laughs> it was just a bunch of, like, oh, enjoy this movie that Fatim Events is proud to show you. And it's just repeating that same message again and again. It wasn't really showing us anything. It wasn't really showing us any previews. Nothing that the Fatim Events guy, you know, promises at the beginning. It's just, it was just, like, repeating the same, like, graphic scrolls. But luckily, they curtailed that. They stopped it. And then they restarted again, which got me worried. And, oh, no, we're going to have to sit through this again. But then, nope, nope. They just cut right to the end. Uh, apparently, there was some, like, trivia quiz that we could have, like, entered and answered questions. They, they have that, they have that, like, every Fathom events, though. Yeah, It's so... just, like, their survey thing where, like, if you do it, you could win, like, $100 Amazon gift card or whatever they're giving out. Yeah. So, we didn't get those questions, so we couldn't answer those. But uh, luckily, mm. our movie started without us having to wait for half an hour. So yep. that was worth it. Yep, it was a pretty good decision on AMC's part. Yeah. So, I am quite relieved. Like, overall, the movie only started five minutes later. So, you know, yeah. that wasn't too bad. And we got quite a surprise at the beginning of the movie. Well, not a surprise, like, I expected it, but, you know, it was still uh, a pleasant entertainment uh, in some ways. I guess just to talk about the theater experience, we mentioned it before, only, like, seven people there, including us. Uh, the group of four guys that came in, that before us, like, only slightly before us, like, we literally saw them walk into the theater right as we were about to get inside the door as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, they did not arrive too much ahead of us. I was worried that they would, like, talk throughout the movie because they were, like, being very loud and jovial before the movie started. But that wasn't the case. They were pretty decent throughout the movie. They laughed when they needed to. They whispered, but they didn't, like, make any obnoxious noise. So that was mm -hmm. cool. And the one other guy who was in the theater 
who came in last, uh, he, he just didn't interact with anyone. And he, was, yeah. he didn't make any noise. I don't know how he enjoyed the movie. I know how those group of four guys enjoyed the movie. They thought it was, they thought it was cool, at least. They didn't sound amazingly enthusiastic, but they thought that the movie was interesting. And they asked their friend who actually had seen the movie before, or at least knew stuff about Lupin, like what Miyazaki did on the franchise exactly. And they seemed like pretty interested in what part four was from the clips that they showed of that at the end. So hopefully this movie yeah. turns some guys onto Lupin. Yeah, I know. I know the one guy that he was with. He was planning to go to both screenings. Like well, the, that one guy yeah. brought his friends to the theater. Yeah, obviously. So he. He's the Lupin fan among them. He's the one who really cares. At the very least, he's a weeb who likes seeing yeah. things both dubbed and sub and just likes watching anime. He's one of the five Lupin fans in Minnesota. Because yeah. apparently there's very few, according... Well, the seven to... if you're talking about us, too. Yeah, like, I guess. Not counting us as Lupin fans. Uh, okay, yeah, seven Well, Lupin wait fans. a minute. Actually, you might be right about that. But no, you you say maybe four then? We don't know about that other guy. I don't know. I I was joking because of the fact that when Sonny Strait came to Anna Minneapolis a few years back, he had a panel and asked how many people had seen Lupin, and only one person raised his hand. I This is something that really bothers me, and this is a conversation that we've been having in regards to the ratings of... Lupin on Tanami is that, like, how do people not know Lupin? Like, in some respects, yeah, I know why people don't know Lupin. It's an old franchise. It's not the kind of anime that most anime fans gravitate towards. But it's also, like, one of the most popular and long-running franchises. How do you have you not come across Lupin if you've been in this community for, you know, more than a year? I, I, I think the thing is, is that a lot of, like, people watch and they aren't like hardcore fans or people who really seek out new anime like a lot of people will just like hear word of mouth from like the people who do do that which are far and few and be like oh hey one punch man oh hey death note oh hey fma i'm gonna watch these they're not gonna look for stuff like lupon because sure lupon has talked a lot on like anna twitter and the more hardcore anime areas of the net but in casual conversation, it doesn't show up because it's not as, I guess, visible among the mainstream. I guess so. I mean, I guess that's how we used to be when we were like young. Fans. Except, except for us, back in the day when we started getting into anime, Lupin was heavily, a lot more heavily promoted. Because I'm like, fun. If you remember, if you people remember, like the old Funimation VHS tape days. The, the good old days before anime was ruined by the normies. Uh, well, specifically, if you remember the days of the Funimation channel, Lupin movies used to play on that. Well, that too, but, like, if you remember on, like, the old Funimation VHS, they'd actually promote the Lupin uh, specials that they were dubbing. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, I remember, like, there was one, like, I forget which special it is, but it's, like, where Lupin is, like, a private eye or whatever. I have no clue what that is off the top of my head. I, you remember the trailer for that, though, right? I don't know if I do. The trailers I remember are the ones for it that were aired on the Funimation channel, and I just remember, like, I saw trailers with Lupin on the Funimation channel. Yeah. I don't know if I ever watched any of those movies. I don't think I did. I just... That's how I knew about Lupin first. Well, yeah. Was from Funimation channel. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, like, on the Funimation VHSs. Because on the VHSs, before, like, they would play the usual, like, DBZ or Dragon Ball episodes on them. They'd actually promote Lupin and Blue Gender. Those were, like, the two big ones they'd usually promote. I remember Blue Gender. I don't remember Lupin. How do you not remember the Lupin ones? That's how I got it to Lupin, man. It's because of those trailers. You did not get into Lupins through those trailers. Now that's what... The you didn't watch Lupin until after I got into yeah. Lupin. And that was years later. Okay, that's how I became aware of Lupin, which indirectly got me into Lupin. No, I got you into <laughs> Lupin because I got into it through watching it on Toonami Aftermath, the Red Jacket dub. And I liked it. 
And then I sought out other installments of the franchise, including the old special Funimation dub and the Castle of Cagliostro, which I showed you because it was on Netflix at the time. And I'm pretty sure that was the first Lupin thing you ever saw was watching okay, that movie. Okay, okay, okay. Fine. It didn't get me into Lupin, but that's how I became aware of Lupin as a franchise. Sure. sure. Yeah. So, like, I feel like back then it was easier to actually come across Lupin. Because Funimation was promoting it, and uh, the way anime promotion works now is that all of it's, like, online. And it's not gonna be forced in... Fr- I, well, I guess not really. I don't really like using the word forced, but it's essentially forced. Because, like, commercials and stuff on TV and all that. You, like, it's not... Since you're not required to look at the, at the ads, you don't seek them out. Like, tra- I feel that that's why trailers in general just have a lot less impact on, like getting people into stuff if they aren't, like, in situations where people are going to be forced to watch them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's why I feel Lupin is, among the mainstream, it's less present. Well, that's pretty clear that if you didn't already know about this movie and you don't attend Fathom events, you weren't going to, like, know. Because the only way you would know about this is if you're in the anime bubble. And you get see this being retreated, the trailer, this news that, you know, you can see Castle of Cagliostro on the big screen. Or if you go to Fathom Events, and you happen to go early enough to sh- show the trailer for it. Because mm. they do that, you know, I went to... Which which Fathom event was it that I went to that I saw that trailer? But I know Bonnie that... Bonnie and Clyde? Maybe. Maybe it was at Bonnie and Clyde. That when we went to that, we saw the, you know, trailer for this. Because Fathom Events promotes their upcoming Fathom Events. Yeah, which is good. Yeah. So, you know, you can find out about it that way. But if you're not, like, into anime, like, you're still not going to have an incentive to watch it. Because those Fathom Events trailers, you know, they might give you awareness, but they're not the best cut. They don't, like, excite you usually about the film if you're not already interested in it. So, you know. Yeah, none, none of, even the trailers that Eleven Arts did themselves for this, since they're the ones who are doing the distribution through Fathom Events, like, their trailers were kind of meh. Like, maybe, maybe I'm just spoiled by all the discotheque Lupin trailers, because those are, like, fantastic, but, uh, I don't know, they're just like, oh, hey, you know Hayao Miyazaki, well, guess what? He did this super niche film before all those Miyazaki Ghibli films you heard of. It's called Lupin, Castle of Cagliostro. Yeah. See, it's, it's Miyazaki. You're going to watch it now, right? Right? Please watch it. Please watch it. We're, we're spending money to put this in theaters. Please watch it. Yeah, I think that... Eleven Arts, I think that they could have done a better job spreading awareness about this. I'm hoping that they'll do a better job with a silent voice, because that's a movie that... Uh, have have you seen it. the trailer for it? I haven't. You know, that's the thing. I didn't it's, ever see a trailer for the theatrical screening of this. It's it's pretty much... It is very similar to the regular theatrical trailers, but for right here, the subs on it are pretty shit. Oh my, that is not good news. I hope the subs in the actual movie will be okay. Yeah. I mean, I I can't see how you can mess it up since there's perfectly good subs in the UK already for it. Yeah, so that would be very strange if they messed that up. Yeah. Yeah, Eleven Arts is not great at this promotion I completely forgot they were even a thing before they announced that they had Silent Voice. Yeah, I they don't have a great brand identity because I don't know what their stuff is. Cause no, they're, they're like the thing is that they're just a film distribution company. I think. Yeah, I don't know what they distribute. So, <laughs> I don't know what else of theirs I've seen that they've distributed. And that's that's the point. Like, they they aren't like culturally present. Yeah. No, they just don't have a great brand awareness. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, if you look at any of the other anime distributors, like you get a sense of like what they're all about and what then they have like. Uh, iconic logo. Yeah. Like, even, even it. like, if it's just a film distribution company, like, I'm, like, far more aware of Screen Vision Media than I am of Eleven Arts. Yeah. Like, I think Eleven Arts teams up with other yeah, distributors. So, 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 I think, yeah. like, I think, like, in Silent Voice's case, it's a Pony Canyon film. Yeah. At least that's what I'm assuming, because it's Pony Canyon production, but they're partnered with them to distribute it. 
Yeah, so, I mean, this would have to be a partnership between Discotech and Eleven Arts. I- I'm so assuming either guess... Discotech and Eleven Arts or Discotech and TMS and Eleven Arts. Well, yeah, it's yeah. the same thing. But, yeah, so, that's probably... Yeah, I don't know who to blame for the bad promotion. I know I can blame Wee Lord for making so much unnecessary noise that's going to be hard for me to edit out. <laughs> Stop, like, slamming. I, Stop I blame... slurping your damn... He still has the... No! Oh, my God! <laughs> he still has his freaking so- cup. The soda cup from the theater, and he's, like, still drinking it? You know, that's one thing, is that we're actually recording this after seeing the movie for once instead of waiting, like, a week. But, well, <laughs> either way, I have seen other films that Eleven Love Marts have helped distribute in theaters before. Like what? Rose on Panza, the film. I don't even know if that screened in Minnesota. Yeah, I don't think it did. Uh, they did Digimon Try Chapter 1. I don't know why they don't keep doing the Digimon movies in theaters. Like, this is an off-tangent thing, but like... Yeah, they, they, I saw the DVD for Chapter 2, and I was like, wait, I thought they would show this in theaters. First. I think they showed it in, like, L.A. and New York, because they get everything that said. I, no, I didn't even hear an announcement oh. that they would show it, so I don't think no, they did. I guess strange. the other ones are just going to be direct to video. <laughs> I don't know if that means... Wait, isn't Eleven Arts doing the No Game, No Life film? They might be. I think that they're involved with a lot of distributions, oh, yeah. actually. So, and I don't know if it's Eleven Arts' fault. I think it's like the original like distributors' fault. So, I think Discotech should have done a better job. I don't know. Like Discotech themselves seemed to promote it a fair bit. It was. It's just that they aren't directly involved with the film part because they're a home. You know, I guess company. just getting back to the root of the problem is that Lupin does not have that great brand awareness for people outside of the anime community and even inside the anime <laughs> community because it's not the kind of franchise that appears to the casual or like yeah. younger crowd which is like most of the anime audience is like the younger like guys. like even then like i guess if we're going off another 11 arts film i think silent voice is going to do way better even if 11 arts promotes it like terribly simply yeah. because it's Kind of a conversation name, because everyone compares it to your name. Yeah, it's newer. Yeah, Lupin, though, is this old franchise that, yeah, it has a cult following in the U.S., but your average intro anime fan who's only watching their One Punch Mans and Attack on Titans is not going to be aware of it. You know, maybe people who watch Mother's Basement will go see it, because he put out a review of that, which was okay. But, you know, at least he promoted it. It was okay. At least he promoted it. You know, that's a good thing. Because a lot of yeah. people at least might watch guys like him and go, this is a movie. You know, I'm glad he did that. Yeah. Now, if only he'd stop making clickbait videos. <laughs> Why are we talking about anime YouTubers? I, mean, I don't care about anime YouTubers. If we YouTubers want to talk right about now, the I best. I want to talk about Lupin <laughs> the Third, the Catholic Act. We Since we're becoming this mainstream. No, we're not. We're, 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 we don't even have 100 subscribers on YouTube. We're not mainstream. <laughs> no, I mean, we're becoming mainstream anime fans. So forget about Lupin. No, that is an <laughs> awful, awful thing to be. I don't want to forget about Lupin. Lupin is a classic franchise, one of my favorite anime franchises of all time. And it's... this movie, for the longest time, I thought this would be the best Lupin movie. I thought this was the it's best Lupin movie. It's not the best Lupin movie. Yeah, you know, we're going to get into the film, but I definitely think that my reevaluation of the film has changed in interesting ways. But I want to go back to, like, what happened before the movie started and talk about the interview that the Fathom Events host... I don't remember his name. It doesn't matter. He didn't, Bill kind of, he didn't contribute anything, Sid. He doesn't matter. Yeah, he did not offer any insightful opinions on this movie. It's completely different if you saw Star Trek II Wrath of Khan because he did an interview with William Shatner before that. And that was, like, a very passionate it's, interview. Because that yeah. guy, the Phantom Events host guy, he's a huge Star Wars fan. So he was, like, geeking out, talking with William Shatner. And he even corrected William Shatner when <laughs> Shatner misremembered a story oh, uh, he God. had about, like, filming... Uh, about an event that happened when he was filming a Star Trek movie where he was, like... Where he, like, the set was on fire. The host of the Phantom Events... Get, 
He, he, he said, oh, uh, Will, that wasn't on Star Trek 2. That was on Star Trek 3. <laughs> you know? So that was a fun conversation because that yeah. guy was, like, such a huge Star Trek nerd that he could even correct William Shatner on his own memories and <laughs> assertions. And so that was a fun conversation. I, I, think, I think a lot of these guys that Fathom Events hires are people who very no, much know American live-action films. Maybe, yeah, I, I would like, say that... I, I think, like, stuff like Lupin, l- let's face it, like, the f- co-founder of Pixar was the guy that he interviewed in this, and he kind of says, like, Lupin showed me that, proved to me that animation isn't just for kids. Well, I still feel that the people in, like, entertainment today still feel that it's for kids. Which is why they don't watch animated films like Lupin. Yeah, I don't think that guy was that invested in Lupin. I want to know what that guy's name was. <laughs> I can't remember it at all. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, no, the no. interview with Chatner, I can find that a transcript of that. I don't know what the guy's name is. I, who is the Fathom Events host? Like, if you I, go to the Fathom, Fathom Events page, it might show. No, that's what I did, and I can't find the information. I don't know where to look. Like, who is the guy that hosts these Fathom events and does, does these interviews? I know it's a di- it's a different guy from, than the TCM class. Yeah, yeah. Fathom I think event. that guy's name is Bill Mankiewicz. This yeah, that, that guy's guy. Bill Mankiewicz. This is a different guy. And yeah. I don't know his name at all. He's not as cool as Bill. You know, Bill, he was, Bill. He was great in the Star Trek one. <laughs> okay, I'll have to see that, though. But Bill... Bill knows his stuff. Bill goes in there and teaches us information about these films. What did this guy do? (laughs) Bill Mankiewicz just spouts facts about the film. He makes it sound cool. I mean, I guess, but they're like one minute intro, one minute outro, and it doesn't like go in depth on the film. Like, I do learn stuff, but it's not like stuff I couldn't learn by reading the Wikipedia page. It doesn't matter. I don't know. I don't know this guy's name. Uh. Someone in the comments, tell me his name or I'll probably know it when I go see E.T. And yeah. No, I probably won't because that'll be uh, TCM. I'll know it when I see another fan of events. Like, maybe he'll interview <laughs> someone for the Pokemon run. Who knows? Wait, Who is knows? that 11 Arts? No, I don't know. I don't know if that is. Who cares? Uh, yeah. Anyway, this interview with John Lassner. So, John Lassner, you know, is famous for his love of Castle of Cagliostro. Like, he has cited it as a huge inspiration for him and his career. And I don't feel that he did a great job explaining why. I don't uh, think he... I, th- I think he hasn't seen the film in a while, probably. Yeah, because, see, the, the they keep saying, like, really generic stuff about why the movie Like, they, they couldn't remember... Great action. Yeah. Great comedy. Fun characters. The main character, he's kind of a... He's kind of a scamp. His sidekicks are the best guns... Shot in the world and Miss Swords in the world. They, gave, they don't remember Jigen and Goemon's names. They don't remember Loop. I mean, they remember Lupin's names, but yeah. the, the freaking host guy. The Fathom Events wrong. guy, yeah. He pronounces like Lupin. Yeah, he pronounces Lupin. At least Lassender, he pronounces it Lupin. So at least he knows yeah. what's up. He understands his shit. They don't address like the fact that this Lupin the Third is a franchise at all. They just. Discuss it in regards to Miyazaki's career. Because Lassender is a... Like, and they also say, like, oh, this is what made Miyazaki big. Not, nah, I don't know. I mean, sort of, yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, he had work before this, though. He had work before this, but, like, this was his theatrical debut. Yeah, this was his theatrical debut. And that's, like, what got his name out there, Yeah, in a big way. Yeah, in that regard, yeah, but, like, it made it sound like, oh, this is, like, the first thing he ever, like, did... In animation, which like, definitely which is, is not true because he did work yeah. before. As I mean, he worked on Lupin Part One. Yeah, but and they don't address like anything in regards to the franchise of Lupin. They talk about like, oh, this movie was really yeah. inspirational. I, I think part of it is that they might not even be familiar with Lupin outside of Castle of Cagliostro. Yeah. Like because, even even among my own friends, like there are people who have. Watch Castle of Cagliostro, but I've never seen anything else Lupin related, just because it has Miyazaki's name on it. Well, that's a shame, considering there is plenty of Lupin with Miyazaki's name on it, and yeah. this movie is not representative of Lupin as a whole. It, it so is, it is, I wouldn't say it's very sanitized. It's a Miyazaki film that just happens to have Lupin characters. Yeah. And sort of name only. We'll get really, the other yeah, of the movie. especially with Fujiko. Talk- 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, and she's kind of the closest in some ways. But, mm-hmm. you know, last there was like two really baffling things that kept popping up in the interviews. Because Lasseter was saying these things over and over again. It's like, this movie, it proved to me that animation was not just for kids, but adults too. This is a movie for that adults can enjoy. And he keeps saying the same variation of that, like again and again, a dozen times throughout this entire interview. Just the same thing that, oh, this movie, it shows that animation was not just for kids. It's also for adults. It was groundbreaking because it's, it's not for adults, you guys. I mean, it's not for kids, you guys. It's for adults. It's, it's animation. It's just for kids. <laughs> and, and also, what oh he keeps god. saying is that, oh my god, I'm so envious of you guys that you get to see this on the big screen. I wish I could see it on the big screen. And I'm like, why, Lassiter? Why can't you see this on the big screen? Why don't you have time to go like Jeez. one night to see this movie on the big Sid, screen? Sid, 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 I'm sure Coco is filling up every single second no, of No, I life. don't deny that he's busy. I'm just like, really? You can't even spare one night to go see Lupin? Yes, yes, the film that got him late. He can't go see it. Yeah, and like, of course he regales the story of how he wooed his girlfriend and later wife by showing her clips from Castle of Cagliostro. And that's why this movie is so good. Yes, because it got him laid. It got him laid and married. You know, that's, that's good for the him. The Miyazaki guarantee. Yeah, yeah. And he, he tells me, apparently he's told Miyazaki-san that before. He literally calls him Miyazaki-san. So that's, yeah. that was pretty fun. He, yeah. Uh, also, his shirt... <laughs> It is amazing. I want to know where to get it because it has like all the Pixar characters on it and it's like awesome. And also Winnie the Pooh, which was weird. Like, it, it's Pixar characters, but then there's Winnie the Pooh. And then I also saw like uh, the robot from Big Hero 6. Baymax. I think I've seen that shirt online somewhere. I don't know. I, yeah, it might be commercially available. I just thought yeah. that was a cool shirt and it was very fitting that he wore that. Like to signify, yeah, this guy is the head of Pixar and Disney Animation, so he's wearing a shirt that represents the spread of Disney Animation. That's freaking sweet. So yeah. I really like that. I really like that touch that he, that but, he uh, did that. In general, though, that that interview kind of just got redundant. It, it got redundant really fast. They did not have a lot to say. I, I think it's like, oh, we, oh, we there have was this... one in- moment where he last year got into detail a little more specifically about... You know, the use of the multi-plane camera in the movie, which is interesting. And, of course, you know, he commented on, like, the iconic car chase scene, which is what he considers, like, one of the best car chase scenes ever put to film. Thank you, Tomonaga. Yeah. And uh, also comments on some other notable scenes that, you know, inspired uh, other films, other people. They mentioned Spielberg because Spielberg was influenced by this film. Like, the host guy brings up the Indiana Jones franchise, which is like one thing it influenced. But you could also see a more direct influence of Lupin in The Avengers of Tintin. In like the, cause that has a very similar like big chase scene. That, yeah, that, yeah. That has many parts reminiscent of both the car chase scene and the scene where Lupin is out on the roof and other elements of Castle of huh. Yeah, I never, I never really thought about that, but yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. So they mentioned that, and then just speaking about influences, they don't mention like other influences, but in general, this film was like very influential on just a lot of media in general. Like, it's been influenced on games. Uh, Apparently Clarice was like an early Moe character design. Which is, I guess you could call it that. The original wife. Like, the clock tower scene directly inspired, like, uh, the Big Ben scene in Great Mouse Detective, as well as the Clock King episode of Batman the Animated Series. One of the best episodes of that show. And the scene where they reveal, like, the underwater Roman city, that inspired similar imagery in Atlantis Lost Empire. And also the roof top scene was homage in the Simpsons movie, where Bart also rolls down the roof of the house in the same way uh, Lupin did. 
Mm. So, you know, you can... Those are just, like, the most famous references to this film. The most famous examples of its influence and being homaged in other media. Uh, there's probably countless more that don't go mentioned as often. Because this film is extremely influential. Aside from being Miyazaki's debut work and, like, kind of launching, like, his career in a broader capacity, this movie... You know, as Lasseter said, it did open doors for a- animation and showing, like, the potential of the animation medium, like, the kind of stories it could tell. And also just in terms of some of the technical accomplishments of, like, you know, the of, with several scenes, that was pretty revolutionary in of itself. Mm. And, yeah, for sure. You know, obviously, because it was an animated film, it came out in the 70s, it didn't get immediate, like, critical acclaim worldwide. Well, at least not by a large movie-going public. Like, people who saw it liked it, I guess. But, you know, it took years for this film. And I guess for people like Lasseter to come out and say, this film, like, really inspired me. It showed me what animation could be. It showed me what the kind of great, cool things we can do in this medium. That live action just can't match. And I think that there's a lot to be said about that. I think that the movie holds a very important place in animation history. As a result of that. So I think it was great that they got Lasseter, the most outspoken advocate of this movie and its significance, to come on for an interview. I just wish it was a more focused <laughs> interview. I wish the uh, the host guy knew more about the movie. They or probably should have more. had they probably should have had them watch the movie before they talked about I it. I don't you know, that's not fair. Maybe they did. I, I'm just saying, like, maybe they, they should have had more specific like they questions. They should have just had, like, more structure to that interview. Because they just kept saying the same things again and again. And they were, like, just, it felt like they were padding it out to, like, ten minutes or however long that interview yeah. was. I don't know. I'm like, pretty sure they interspliced that Coco trailer to pad <laughs> it out as well. But that Coco yeah. trailer was really cool. Uh, that was my first time seeing anything of Coco. So I am pretty interested in it. That was a good show. Yeah, okay. I'm actually glad that they put that so I got awareness of it. Yeah. But yeah, overall, that interview... Uh, of the two interview segments attached to this movie, definitely the weakest one. Definitely the one you're going to get least the, out the, of. The end interview is people we care about. Lasseter's amazing and all, but the end part's more relevant to the movie. It's actually... People who worked on Lupin yeah. who talk about it. So we'll get to that just after we talk about the movie itself. And interesting thing about the movie is that we saw this dubbed. And it's the streamlined dub. I was so confused because it's been years since I've seen the other dub. What is the other dub? Mong Entertainment? The Mong I Entertainment have seen that dub. before. That was what it was on Netflix way back in the day. That was the first time we watched it was with that dub. Uh, Doug, from what I remember, was whatever. It was, it was, I think that, it was uh, a solid C average. Sure. Like, that is the one with Richard Epcar as Goemon. Which uh, is actually, I don't think it has Richard Epcar as Goemon. One of them has Richard Epcar, and it wasn't the one we saw. It wasn't the streamlined one. Yeah. That did not sound like Epcar. Was that Epcar? I'm checking right now. Um, it was not Epcar. Yeah, it was not Epcar, so he was in the other one, the manga one. No, he's not in the manga one either. The manga Goemon is Michael Gregory. I thought he played Goemon in something. I'm actually going to check that right now. Because I think, yeah, he did do it in some dub. It might have been an Asian dub, but he's mentioned before. Cause yeah. Well, either way, checking. you know, I was surprised. I didn't realize that it was the a different dub. Until, like, they actually start calling him Wolf. Yeah, because it's like, we, we haven't seen this dub in ages, so I don't even remember what the manga entertainment dub sounds like. Yeah. And if I were to rewatch the film today, since it's not the Genion cast or the Funimation or any of those casts, I would probably just watch the sub. Well, yeah, I see, I'm not familiar with these voices for the characters because I'm familiar with uh, the Gen the Genion dub of part two I'm fam- and part four by Discotech and the yeah. Funimation dub. I'm familiar with those voice casts. I'm not familiar with these one-off voice casts for these movies because they did not surprise their roles every day. So I thought something was weird when Jigen was kept calling Lupin boss. 
And then after, like, the servant guy tells the Duke, like, oh, I, there's a message from Lupin on my back. And he starts reading it. And after he finishes that, the Duke says, that's the wolf. And after he <laughs> says, that's the wolf, they refer to him as wolves throughout the rest of the movie. Yeah, they whenever refer, they only refer to him as Lupin <laughs> once. Yeah, and so it's is... very strange. Yeah, I mean, and that's why they have Gideon call Lupin boss. Like they go out of their way to avoid calling him Lupin. Yeah, it seemed like they kind of knew, like, okay, this wolf name is just dumb. Let's try to avoid it as much as possible. No, they didn't avoid the wolf name at all. They just didn't have Gideon call him start out calling him Wolf so that they could say his name as Lupin first and then call him Wolf and then call him Wolf the rest of the movie. So his name is still Lupin, but everyone is referring to him by his nickname. It's dumb. It's strange. Uh, And yeah, the whole Gene calling Lupin boss, that really... The things about this dub that bothers me is Gene calling Lupin boss because that's not their relationship at all. They're partners... And Jigen does not think of Lupin as his boss. So that, you know, bothered me. Just on, like, a characterization level. And then, obviously, they add dialogue to scenes that didn't have dialogue, to moments that didn't have dialogue. Luckily, they don't do it for every scene that's dialogue-less. Because, thank lord, uh, they kept some quiet moments in. But, like, they added dialogue in very unnecessary places. Like, when Lufon is, like, has been shot, and he's, like, on the roof, and, like, Fujiko is, like, you know, trying to help, but she notices, like, there are guys on both sides. Like, they add in the line where she says, oh, I'm surrounded. And it's moments like that, where they add in dialogue that's really obvious to us, the viewer, because we can mm. see, we have eyes, this is a visual medium. But they add in dialogue to, I guess, clarify things to you. Like, it's so it's unnecessary like, and superfluous. Yeah. Like, I'm assuming they didn't use the other dub because of, like, some, like, theatrical rights reason. Cause, some like, licensing reason, I'm sure. Some like, there's reason. there's no way they... Unless, like, Eleven Arts somehow thought that people had nostalgia for this dub. Which I don't think... I think it's, like, generally accepted that the manga entertainment dub is the good dub. Mm-hmm. Like, people in general do not like Streamline's dubs. Like, the Kira Streamline dub is notorious for being bad. Yeah. And then another thing, a huge scene is, like, changed in terms of, like, the message communicated to when Lupin is first meeting Clarice, because he used, he used very blatant dialogue saying, I'm here to help. Like, his first line to Clarice is, like, I'm here to help you with your permission. That's not what he says in the original. What he says is, like, I'm here to steal you away. You know, he uses metaphors of stealing her. Not that, you know, he's going to be her hero. Like, he does eventually say that he'll be her knight and whatever, but first he keeps up, like, these teeth illusions and that whole gimmick. So that it's, like, changes the character of him and of Clarice, because they add, like, dialogue... They, they change the dialogue of Clarice so that she's, like, even naiver than the original, because she's, like, oh, I, you're too kind. Oh, she, it's, like, really lame dialogue where she's, like falls over Lupin immediately and, like, really acts even more like a damsel figure than even in the original, which is very strange. I did not like those changes in dialogue that, like, really messed up both Lupin's and her characterization. But overall, in terms of performances, I think that all the main actors did fine. Uh, Goemon's voice was a little weird, but everyone else's voice was fine, and everyone... Like, the guy who does Zenigata, he was great. Yeah, he he, he, was, he was the best. Um, among everyone, he was the best. Worst-wise, it would probably be Fujiko. I really didn't like Fujiko's voice. Yeah, Maybe it's because I'm just spoiled by Michelle Ruff, and she's kind of become the go-to for, yeah. like... Fujiko. But that's or, fair. I, yeah. I thought she was fine, though, especially in the scenes in the church where she's playing the newscaster. You know? Yeah, over time it grew on me, but I don't know. It felt just a bit too deep for me. Yeah, I think the Duke's voice was also really good. Yeah, Duke, Duke's voice was good. Yeah. Who did those voices, I wonder? I know, like, the people who did the 
David mainly. Powell did uh, Zenigata, and he, you know, another weird thing is that they mispronounce Zenigata's name. They call him Keibu Zenigata. Keibu means inspector in Japanese, so I don't know. I guess they got his name wrong. Yeah, it's very maybe. weird. It's very weird mistake, but I guess that's uh, early nineties dub for High you. High quality streamlined dub. So the guy who plays Zenigata has only done stuff for other uh, streamlined dubs, apparently. And let's see, who played the Duke? I think they call him the Duke in this one. So, yeah, the guy who played the Duke, he's the narrator in Boba Bo and Hunter Hunter. That explains why his Holy voice shit, is so he's familiar. One the, he's one of my favorite characters, the narrator in Boba Bo. <laughs> that explains why that voice felt so familiar. It was like, huh, I know I've heard this guy before. Oh, I was like, he's done oh, so much. He was Swartzwall and Big O. Okay, That's yeah. A freaking great character. I, like, I knew, like, okay, yeah, I know this guy is still in dubs because I've heard him recently, but I just couldn't, like, put a name on it. He was King Kai in the Bang Zoom dub of Dragon Ball Super. I keep forgetting that's a thing. I do, too. I wonder if it's any good or not. He's, I've heard mixed He's roast you, adult roast you and Gurren Lagann. Yeah. This guy's done a bunch of stuff. I want to just see all the ones. He's Babo and Mare. Yeah, see, yeah. I'm repeating all of this together. The more I <laughs> l- look, it's like, wow, uh, this guy really has done some pretty cool roles that have stuck uh, the, with me. The, he's been around for, like, ages, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this, this guy... He's the Michael, one big talent in Michael this. Mick... Michael McConaughey. He's a great actor, probably the best actor overall. Everyone else was kind of eh. Yeah, everyone else was kind of... Uh, oh, Kirk Torton played the Archbishop. Not a name I recognize. Yeah. He was also Gustav. Okay. Okay. That's interesting, because yeah. he plays the Count in the manga entertainment dub. So that's interesting. He he gets upgraded from playing the Count <laughs> Lackeys to the Count himself in the manga entertainment Yeah, dub. so I was looking it up, like, trying to figure out where Epcar played Jig, and I think it was, like... In a UK version of the dub. I guess Because, so. like, for a lot of manga entertainment dubs, they had a separate version for the UK version. Hmm. Which is why Ep- Epcar was also involved in a lot of those. Like, I know for Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence, they had him, like, completely rewrite the script by himself and, like, make his own interpretation of the film. It was very strange. Yeah. Well, it's not like it would have mattered much anyway, because as much as I like hearing Epcar, you know, going on does not do much in this film. Like, he's kind yeah. of an afterthought. Like, yeah, he does less in this film than he does in Mamo. Yeah, he does virtually nothing. You could probably take him out of the movie and very little exchange, because all he is involved in is, like, in the group battle sequences, like, yeah. in the way in the church. Yeah, so, yeah, Goemon didn't do much. Yeah, and Fujiko at least, like, was involved in helping uncover the conspiracy. Like, she helped Lupin and Clarice escape uh, on the roof, and then she got both Lupin's gang and Zenigata to get her to get in on, like, stopping the wedding at the church. And then she helped Zenigata expose the Count's counterfeiting scheme. And then she stole the plates, the printing plates. Mm. For herself. So, like, she did a lot in this movie when you think about it. Because, like, she was a linchpin in, like, saving the day. And she got what she wanted at the yeah. end, too. So that was pretty good of her. Yeah. I have, like, uh, mixed feelings about this interpretation of Fujiko. On one hand, it still is, like, pretty accurate compared to the other cast members. Mm-hmm. But I feel it tries to, like, paint her more as, like, a straightforward feminine badass. Instead of, like, a more, like, subversive awesome female character that other interpretations of her do. I have no problem with Fujiko in this film. I mean, she does a lot of really fun, awesome things. Oh, yeah. I'm like, not she's just... still shooting people. She's throwing grenades. Yeah. But she I'm, is a really I'm not, cool I'm not, character. I'm not denying that. She was in a lot of fun when she's, I'm like, not, being like... a newscaster and she's, like, commenting on all the counts, uh, all the shenanigans in the church and the craziness going on while, like, shooting <laughs> the Count's men as they, like, try to attack her while still carrying on with the broadcast. Like, that was great. She like, was great. I, I'm not denying any of that was awesome. That was all awesome. I don't know. I, I just don't like this interpretation of Fujiko compared to other interpretations. Mm-hmm. But I feel that 
compared to like how Lupin's depicted, like Fuchiko's depicted a lot better in this film. Like in terms of like compared to like the rest of the Lupin franchise. Mm-hmm. Like at the very least, Miyazaki did a better job of treating Fujiko like a character than Takashi Koike and his uh interesting depiction of Fujiko. Sure, yeah. I think uh, just in general, we should talk about the change in style and tone from the rest of the Lupin franchise with this film, because this is a more family-friendly Lupin. The idea of it is that this is an older, wiser Lupin who's kind of grown up a little bit. It's ten years from when Lupin started his career, and so now he's kind of matured, he's mellowed a bit. He's not like the, like, lecherous, like, insane, um, a party animal he used to be. be. Now he's, like, he's still a fun-loving guy. He's still, like, and crazy in terms of his sh- schemes. And but he's, he's mellowed out. He kind of knows yeah. his limits. He's it's... a lot more mature. And you can definitely get that from his intentions. Because his intention in this film is just to help Clarice. You know, to pay her back for her kindness. For helping him out before. Like, that's just a mature thing to do. Just, you know, to help someone selflessly. Completely selflessly. No other agenda. That's mm. very unlike Lupin. Yeah, I mean... Like, I get when Miyazaki's trying to, like, more depict Lupin more as a kind of a noble thief of sorts. But, I I don't know, like... It's interesting how he depicts it, because, yeah, he is trying to show it as, like... Yeah, Lupin has grown up, he kind of is reflecting on his past, going back to this, uh, the land of Cagliostro, or I guess the castle of Cagliostro, or whatever. I forget what the yeah, country is. The country is also called Cagliostro. Is it? Okay. <laughs> the country of Cagliostro is kind of, like, bringing back his old memories... Of kind of when he was more reckless and stuff. Yeah. It's an interesting take on Lupin, for sure. Mm. But I'd say, like, at the same time, it kind of goes against what Lupin as a character stands for. Yeah, it's definitely not tonally consistent with other elements of the Lupin franchise. Because, again, he's not in it for any, like, reason that benefits him. He's just being selfless. He's just being, like, a hero, a knight. Yeah, in the end, in the end he doesn't even steal any treasure or anything. He just, like... He doesn't. Like, Fujiko steals <laughs> the printing. Yeah, Fujiko's like, doing your job. Like, yeah, Lupin, Lupin just, just did like... not get anything out of it, out of, like, the satisfaction of helping someone, which is not... Like, Lupin yeah. helps people. Lupin he helps people. Like, helps people to an end that benefits him. Yeah, like, Lupin's not heartless or anything, but it's no. like, he usually, if, when he initiates a task, he does it for selfish reasons. If he helps someone along the way, that's just kind of a side thing. Yeah. And he's very positive in his outlook and very happy-go-lucky. Like what he's, you say? he's not, he's like, uh, Lupin would be very grumpy and very, yeah. like, bratty. Again, this is a more mature Lupin, so he's not going to act, like, childish. He's just going to, like, take everything with good sense of humor and uh, strive. And so that's very different from, like, normal Lupin as well. Yeah. But, you know, it does have some good parts to it. I think it is very interesting to see an older Lupin and, like, how he behaves. And even if, like, he's not the kind of Lupin that we all have grown to love, the iconic characterization of him. Like, I think one moment that I really love is, like, at the end of the film, where Clarice confesses her love to Lupin, and Lupin is just like... You know, kid, you don't want to get involved with a guy like me. I'm a thief. I'm not a. I'm not a great person. It's not like we'll never see each other again. You can give me a call, and I'll be right there, and you'll be happy. You don't really know what you want right now. You know, your life is just starting, and you'll be happy if you wait for the right person. But I'll always love you like a big brother. Like a, like a big brother. This is such a mature speech and such a mature cut down of this girl's feelings. Like, this is like one of the most mature handling of this kind of moment I've ever yeah. seen in a film or media in general. Like, you don't get a moment like this or dialogue like this in anime usually. Yeah. Or media like, if you, usually. Compare the, if you compare this, like, Lupa Part 4 or, like, Lupin turns out Rebecca at the end. Yeah. Like, it, it's still, it's very different, because, like, Lupin's like, yeah, you can come after if you watch, you, you might not have fun, but... 
Yeah, yeah. He is just so kind and so like wise about it. <laughs> like this like... is a worldly Lupin who's been around the block and kind of knows what's up and like you know is really looking out for this kid. This is the this like the... a big brother. Uh, my theory is that this is the Lupin that is created after Takashi Koike makes fifty of his bloody gory Lupin films. But how does that Lupin become this Lupin? <laughs> because he's so used to the violence and everything that he just decided to bell out and start like fighting woodcutters and shit and just like focus on small things. That would be a very disturbing take if true. <laughs> Maybe he was brainwashed by Mamo, and now that's, like, why he's this way. He was giving him a lobotomy yeah. by Mamo, and so now that removed his edge. That, yeah, this is all This is all somehow going to connect back to Koike's eventual Mamo remake. Yeah, which has never been confirmed. We all know it's he, happening. He's going to make it. He, he, like, fucking referenced it again in uh, uh, Goemon's uh, Spray of Blood. It, it's so happening. <laughs> so... That's the changes in characterization and tone of the kind of Lupin story this is. Again, this is a very Miyazaki film. You definitely get that in the feel in terms of how detailed the setting is. Like the city of Cagliostro, the look of the castle, really detailed, really ornate architecture. Like, it's all in Miyazaki's real house. He does really interesting things with castles in all his films. The Castle of Cagliostro is no exception because it has trapdoors, it has all these different passageways and tunnels. Very interesting designs and very interesting like layout of the place. And of course, the reveal of the Roman city at the end, beautifully stunning. No wonder it's been homage to another media book after yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said before, it's a solid Miyazaki film that just happens out of Lupin characters. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're you beating around the bush of the real issue here. Miyazaki's drug conspiracy. That's right. So the counterfeiting scheme just makes this really obvious. Yeah. And it's, that the government's been helping Miyazaki produce the drugs. Uh, no. Like, this is, like, to turn the kids against the government. Like, the oh. whole point of it was that the old, the, all the inflation in the world, all the money in the world is meaningless because the gov- all, everyone in the government has conspired to print fake money of no real monetary value and distribute it in the populace and this has spread fake wealth around and allowed the rich to get richer off of the backs of the poor and like everyone in the government is in on it. You know that scene where Zenigata is in like the <laughs> United Nations office and all the representatives are talking and they're saying yeah. Zenigata oh we're, we're just gonna you have no proof. Uh, you you can't prove anything and we're not gonna do anything it's, it's, it's anyway it's their guys' fault. It's the Americans' <laughs> fault. It's, it's your CIA who's responsible for this, and then the American. And then they start this fake debate to distract themselves from the real problem. But yeah, and then later when they see on the TV that Zenigata has exposed it, they're saying like, "Oh, well, we can't cover this up." You know, through these scenes, Miyazaki is saying that <laughs> your world leaders can't trust them. They'll <laughs> lie to you. They're incompetent, and they're in fl- and in their the reason. That there's so much inflation and why m- money is increasingly being worth less than it used to be, and why like we're increasingly getting poor. So Miyazaki is using this film to turn you against the government, <laughs> and then turn you on to drugs. Yeah, see, because he's gonna now that he's exposed you to the lies of the government, now that he's made kids mistrust the uh, mistrust like. The guys in charge, mistru- they're going to start mistrusting your parents. Gonna be- they're going to start mistrusting everyone. But you know who they're going to trust? The drug dealers? They're going to trust Lupin. They're going to trust the guy who came in looking out for those innocent young kids and stole their hearts away with thrilling humor and adventure. But Lupin... Who is the man behind Lupin in this film? Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> Lupin, as a character in this film, is a metaphor 
a stand-in for Miyazaki himself. <laughs> he is subliminally brainwashing you oh to God. love him and be as dependent on him as Clarice is <laughs> by the end of this movie. That is the whole point of Clarice falling in love with Lupin. Oh God. Clarice is the children of Japan and henceforth the children of the world. Oh my God. So... As the first step in Miyazaki's master conspiracy to brainwash the youth of the world, he's using this movie to make them lose trust in their government, in their parents, in the people who supposedly are out to protect them but really are not, and to put trust in him. The fun-loving guy who will entertain you, who will be your knight in charming armor, the animator with a heart of gold, Hayao Miyazaki. My mind has been blown. Yeah. You never thought to think of this movie that way, but it's the truth. This is <laughs> the, where it all began. Uh, this this conspiracy is going too deep. Soon Ghibli's going to come and hunt us down. They don't want us to uncover what's going to be in their next film. Well, we're going to uncover it. The next film is another significant one. It's Nausicaa. I will get more into Nausicaa and how the conspiracy unfolds from Cagliostro, you know, in the next episode or something. I don't, I'm probably going to release this before... <laughs> are any, of, are any of these Miyazaki... No, Things none were... of them are out yet. I'm uh, going to release this probably before any of those are out, so all the people in the audience are going to be like, what are they talking about? Miyazaki conspiracy? <laughs> drug dealing? What is this narrative? Yeah, so this has been something me and We Lord have been digging deep into <laughs> since these Ghibli movie screenings have began in June. We realized that there's like this huge, huge conspiracy <laughs> where Miyazaki is like promoting drug use and getting children's <laughs> Addicted on drugs drew subliminal messages in his movies. And, uh, yeah, we're going to expose them to the world. And we just told you how this movie fits into all that. That's the beginning of Miyazaki's theatrical film career. It's getting kids in, uh, to trust Miyazaki over their authority figures. Miyazaki does drugs. Well, he peddles drugs to children through his movies. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. <clears throat> what else in regards to this film do you want to talk about? Oh, just... In regards to the story, so yeah, this is a very basic kind of story. Again, uh, as Monkey Punch puts him himself, it's very much a knight saves a princess kind of story. Very straightforward, black and white, evil, good. And yeah, what makes the movie interesting is just like the location and like how it's certain, animated, the how set it's pieces. Yeah. So it's like the execution that makes it, you know, work as a movie. Yeah. But in terms of the just basic story, it's nothing that special. And especially because the characterization of the Lupin gang are so different. Like, it's interesting to think about Lupin as grown up. But, like, in terms of, like, actually being interested in, like, the characters and how they're used. Aside from Lupin, they don't get out. Oh, Zenigata gets great moments for yeah. sure. But aside from Lupin and Zenigata, like, everyone else feels kind of like an afterthought. So it's not, like, great on the character front. Because Clarice and the Duke are also, like, nothing special. Yeah, well, what definitely makes this film special is the production. Like, if narrative-wise, like, uh, narrative-wise, like, the other Lupin films are stronger, for sure. Yeah. And, of course, there's a big hole in this movie in that if the Count of Foley needed was the rings... Why did he have to marry Clarice, especially yeah, if he was going to kill her in the end anyway? Didn't. Like, so he didn't need to marry Clarice He could have just killed Clarice right away. Or he could have just stolen the ring just earlier. He didn't need Clarice to give like, I, I, her like, the ring. He should have just taken the ring. He didn't need to marry Clarice. He didn't need her to yeah. be a part of anything. He like, I guess that brings himself. the thing of, oh, wait, well, when people know Clar- Clarice is gone, like, no, just he, he could cover it up. Yeah, he could do that, or he could just not kidnap or interfere with Clarice at all. He could just, like, steal the ring. Yeah, just have some, hire some random burglar to steal the ring and then cover it up. It's easy. Yeah, it would have been easy, so... And then he just have to remember not to, like, fucking stand between the two hands of the, like, the clock so that he doesn't die. Yeah, so... Like, whole... when did he jump? 
He could have jumped. Lupin survived. Yeah, I don't know. Like, the whole thing about him wanting to marry Clarice is just to make the audience hate him more and to, like, keep Clarice away from Lupin so she can be yeah. rescued in the end. And, yeah, so still the whole, like, he wants to marry Clarice thing is just it, to dumb. characterize him as an incestuous pedophile. Yay. And uh, that's, 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 those are evil characters. And remember, he's an Atori figure. He is the king of Cagliostro, <laughs> right? He, the, your authority figures, the people in charge of the government, they're lying to you. They're not out for your best interest. They're going to exploit you. They're going to make you marry people you don't love. And they're going to, like, essentially rape you. It's the so only person you can trust. They're going to steal from you and they're going to rape you. The only person you can trust is Miyazaki. Yeah. And, uh, oh, looky here. Uh, here's some special candy. <laughs> so, so special fruits that were grown from Totoro's garden. Uh, why don't you partake, kids? <laughs> the fuck? We've gone too far. No, we haven't. We haven't gone far enough. We need to dig deeper. But I want to just talk about this movie as a movie. So... Again, as I said before, I it was a feel that this was my favorite Miyazaki film and my favorite Lupin movie. But after rewatching it today and with like more critical eye placed upon it, there are amazing scenes in this movie, but this movie also shows its age in various areas. The animation in some scenes is a little choppy. Like the pans are especially like choppy. And that's very distracting. Like, backgrounds? Backgrounds are beautiful. Oh, yeah. Cell shading? Excellent. Like, there's a lot in this movie that, like, is really stunning visually, but there's, in term, but, like, not the whole production is, like, consistently great. But there are moments that, you know, are not up to the standard that you'd expect. And also, again, speaking narratively and speaking, like, as an installment of the Lupin franchise, like, it's not... It doesn't embody the best of Lupin. I like, think it embodies the best of Miyazaki's filmography either. And I just don't think it's like one of the more interesting like stories that's either been done told involving Lupin and told by Miyazaki himself. Like I know people say like, oh, if you want to get into Lupin, start with Castle Cagliostro. I think that is a good like I... introduction and just in terms of like getting you interested because there is like in interesting like scenes there's it's like a really well-made film and it has a great historical importance it's left a great legacy behind but does it embody yeah that's that's what i was gonna say because at the same it's a great film and all but at the same time will watching this film like reflect like i guess will it watch this film like give you the same enjoyment you'll get out of actual traditional Lupin animes. Like, yeah, Miyazaki did direct part of Lupin Part 1, but Lupin Part 1 still feels very different from Castle Cagliostro. Same with the other, like, mainline parts and the films and the specials. Like, there are many different interpretations of Lupin out there, but Castle Cagliostro is kind of, like, in its own little bubble. Yeah. I mean, I would recommend seeing the movie because it is, like, a well-made film. Yeah. It's an important film. It's very interesting to watch. Just like how I saw Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan. And you can see, like, the influences of from that that have permeated our popular culture. Like, this movie is also, you know, worth watching the same way. To, like, yeah. see h- how the beginning of Miyazaki's, like, theatrical career. To see, like... How it, you know, to go back to the roots of like everything that it, it has inspired and how it changed the landscape of animation both in Japan and internationally. Yeah. But unlike Star Trek II Wrath of Khan, does it hold up as like a 10 out of 10? I hate using that like numerical. Is this version. like the centerpiece of the franchise? Is this. Yeah, I don't consider this the centerpiece of the franchise like Star Trek II Wrath of Khan is for Star Trek. Or, like, the absolute strongest film it could be. Now, the actual centerpiece of the Lupin franchise is the woman called Fujiko Mine. Well, Josh Dunham would disagree with you. That's because Josh Dunham's wrong! We should do a manga fight with you against Josh Dunham. You need to just watch the rest of the Lupin franchise before we do that. 
Wait, would it be an anime fair or would we do on the Lupin manga? We could do it on either. Actually, it probably Actually, have to be more on the anime. Because, I yeah, don't I don't think I don't it. think Josh owns the manga. I mean, in the first conversation I ever had with Josh, we argued about Lupin. Because <laughs> um, I don't know who brought it up first, but, like, he was complaining about the woman called Fujigamini, and then we got into discussion about, like, its merits, and, like, I made a comparison to the manga at one point. He said, you know, it's not really like the manga. There's no, like, character called Fujiko in the manga. And I'm like, yeah, there is. And Josh was like, no, the, there isn't, like, a single unified character called Fujiko. There's, it's, it's, there's no consistent characterization. It's just like a design that shows up again and again. I'm like, no. I mean, at first there isn't a consistent well, yeah, Fujiko, yeah. but like if you read the later volumes, like that's uh, Monkey Punch does like create a Fujiko character that remains consistent for the rest of the series in the same way that Jigen and Goemon become consistent for the rest of the series because Jigen also in the like in his first debut is not affiliated with Lupin. He's like a completely different character. Who yeah, like he's like his design. It's like so we got into, I think got into a long conversation about that first time we ever I ever talked to Josh. That was a that was a fun conversation. So yeah, we should talk with uh, Josh Dunn about Lupin sometime. Yeah. I don't know if he's listening to this podcast, but uh. Uh, anyone who knows Josh Nunham, tweet this out to him and say that we'd be game for that. Actually, I'll just ask him myself one day. Who knows? <laughs> who knows when we'll get around to that? Yeah. If you want to get into the Lupin franchise, Castle Cagliostro is a great Miyazaki film. Yeah. Lupin film? Eh? I'd say if you want to get into Lupin, start with part two or part four. Is it Miyazaki's best work on Lupin? I'm not sure. No, it's not. Like, what would you say is between part one and part two? Hmm? He didn't... Did he work on part two? I thought he only He did, on. like, two episodes where he was, like... Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember those. Episode 145, episode 155. I haven't watched those episodes in ages. I remember them being okay, but I think his part one... The episodes that he directed in part one were a lot stronger. Okay. At least from what I recall. Yeah, so maybe watch part one if you want, like, a true-to-character Lupin experience that still has Miyazaki's touch on it. Yeah. But, you know, our theatrical experience did not end with this movie because there was another interview uh, segment after the movie ended. Yeah, which was way better than the first one. It was because it had Monkey Punch and Tomonaga in it. Tomonaga being the animator who did the iconic car chasing in Castle Cagliostro, as well as served as series director for Lupin the Third yeah. Part 4. Ba- basically, Tomonaga is what is who's essentially helming mainland Lupin going forward. Yeah. He's going to be on part five as well. Yeah, it, it's assumed right now that he's going to be on part five as chief director. Yes, and that, this was a great interview section reflecting on, you know, their work, the conception of the film of Cagliostro, and why they think it stood out. And, you know, Tomonaga Ning dropped several of his co- co-workers, fellow animators who worked yeah. on the film. What, what I find interesting is that he never talks about the specific scenes that he did. Like, he mentions, oh... The car chase and stuff, but he never says, oh, I did this scene. It's like... He's very humble. Yeah, he's humble, which I thought, oh, cool. Like, everyone who's, like, more versed in, like, the Lupin fan base knows that, yeah, the car chase scene is Toba Naga. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was interesting to see, like, oh, oh hey, he, ma- he mentioned the scene, like, it's kind of important within the production, but he when he's talking about it, he's mainly talking about Miyazaki and how he was involved. Yeah, and so they make very great comments about, like, some of the most interesting parts about the production of the film, as well as what makes the film, like, so memorable. It's a film that more times you see it, you get more new things out of it, and I certainly think that's true, in my Mm. experience, having seen this film a number of times. And also that even though the story is very archetypical, the execution makes it stand out and memorable. Yeah, Mo- Monkey Punch's comments in general were, I thought, they were very insightful because Monkey Punch, like, nowadays is not really as involved as he was early on. Like, yeah, he's I'd say, of... like, most of his involvement kind of died off after part one, like, early part one. I mean, he's kind of like the Jim Davis in the manga world. <laughs> yeah, like, he, like you know how, like, Lupin, the Lupin movie Dead or Alive yeah. is uh, kind of credited as, oh, written by Monkey Punch. But in interviews, Monkey Punch is like, yeah, after kind of the intro scene, I kind of just sat back and just watched them do their thing. Uh-huh. It's like, yeah, he's he's kind of just there. Like, he, he still does his own mangas, like, 
There are a bunch of like Lupin sequel mangas that he still has a writing role in, though I think the artists that work on them also have a lot more writing input now. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was interesting, like, seeing him comment about Lupin now, like, in the anime medium. Like, uh, well, what really, like, struck me is that when he started talking about newer Lupin was Blue Jacket in particular, he said, the Blue Jacket era is the closest to what he envisioned Lupin in anime to be. A series that still embraces kind of the whole wacky, kind of fun parts of Lupin that he had in the manga, but still tries to tell mature kind of a mature story, which is what Part 4 does, which what is well, what Koike does, even though he kind of does it in a very mm-hmm. different way. Well, it was interesting to me that he commented, you know, the original manga was for adults, but with yeah. the anime, they wanted to also make it appeal to children. Yeah. And so what was interesting is that he's, by saying that Part 4 was closest to his original vision, is not saying that it's the... Closest to the manga. Yeah, it's not the closest to the manga. It's closest closest to his vision of the balance between a Lupin series that can appeal to both adults and children in terms of the balance of its storytelling. Yeah, like, I think the Lupin manga, none of of the anime is perfectly replicated because it's very very much its own thing and a very much... I mean, actually, I mean, Koike's Lupin. Oh, Han, sorry. Okay, yeah, okay, Koi, Koiki's Lupin. Actually, yeah, even more so than Fujikami. In both the good ways yeah, and... Yeah, in both the good ways and the bad ways. And that's oh why God. I think it probably is, like... Maybe Koiki's a really huge fan of, like, the original Lupin manga. Uh, I mean, it's those films are Koike doing his own thing. Like, uh, playing to yeah. his taste. But so they just Koike... have to align with Monkey Punch's taste. Yeah, I have some choice things about that. Mixed but, uh, feelings, no doubt. Yeah, I, uh, Koike, I love your action scenes, but but please treat Fujiko better. Yeah. Please, you're a sequel to the woman called Fujiko Mine. Yeah, but I definitely really enjoyed those that interview with Tomonaga and Monkey yeah. Punch. It was kind of a shame they couldn't also get Miyazaki in there to give his thoughts, but I think just getting those two was really important and really cool to see. Yeah. And I think it was just a great idea for, t- for like, discotheque to put this at the end of the film to also, like, promote part four is when yeah, it's, like, like <laughs> it's availability of Punch Girl and, of course, the ongoing Tanami broadcast. So that was very clever of them. Another clever thing I thought about, like, just how they, like, the clips they chose is that they chose episodes of Lupin that were directed by Miyazaki. Yeah, that, that was cool. So that was cool that they chose episodes of part two that had Miyazaki's direct touch in it. And... So that was very clever of them that they were tying like the old Lupin and the movie that everyone just saw that had Miyazaki's name on it to the new stuff. Mm. That was very clever of them. Yeah, definitely. So that was great stuff and I'm very glad they did that. Yeah, it was very cool seeing having an interview with the guy who started everything and the guy who's pushing it forward now. Uh, That's a great way to put it. Yes, yes. I would love to see more Lupin in theaters. I just want to see more Lupin in general. Can we get a Mamo screening? Maybe one day. Who knows? Uh-huh. I hope so. I honestly want to reevaluate that film again. Yeah, you didn't like Mamo, if I recall. I did not care for it when I, fr- when I first watched it, but I've only ever watched it like two times. So. I-, I like Mamo a lot more than this film. Yeah. Mamo is fun. I definitely will reevaluate it one day. But I guess that does it for this episode of Manga Mavericks Ad Movies. Thank you for joining me, Wheelord GTZ. Any final thoughts about this film before uh, we head off here? Um, I mean, like I said, it's a fantastic Miyazaki film. As a Lupin film, it's very different, but it's fun. It's worth checking out. Maybe not as an entry point to Lupin, but it's something like you check out like after you've kind of dabbled in some Lupin Part 2 or something. Yes, I... Think that sums it up about well. Best not to repeat ourselves like John Lasseter. So <laughs> this film is amazing, guys. I wish I could see it with you. I <laughs> wish I was here in the theater. Well, I hope you, the folks listening at home, do get a chance to see this in the theater. 
Because I think I'll have this out by Tuesday, September 19th, the day when they're showing the subtheatrical screening. So definitely, if you listen to this before 7 p.m. on uh, Tuesday, September 19th, uh, go out to the nearest theater near you that's playing this movie and watch this movie because it's, it's really good. Yeah. And We Lord GTZ, that just about does it. So promote where they can find you. Uh, yes, people can find me on Twitter at VLORDGTZ. That is V-L-O-R-D-G-T-Z. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel free to talk to me about anything. Um, Conan, JoJo, Slayers, I don't know. Just, I, 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 I like a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. And you can find me as at Lomomayasha on Twitter as at Lomomayasha on my relation under that name, on my anime list under that name. Anywhere you can find me, you will find me under the name Lomomayasha. As for the show, you can follow Manga Mavericks, all our podcasts, on allcomic.com. That's where we post them up first. Then you can also find our accounts on Twitter at manga underscore mavericks, on Tumblr, manga mavericks.tumblr.com, our YouTube page, manga mavericks. Just search for it, you'll find it. Remember, guys, we need a hundred subscribers to get that custom URL. So please subscribe and like our content on there. That really helps our channel grow. We're also on iTunes, and any ratings and reviews would be greatly appreciated. That also would really help the show out. And if you want to contact us, Send us any feedback, suggestions, share your thoughts about Lupin the Third, or anything else that you know you are watching or reading lately related to anime and manga. You can send any of that to manga mavericks at gmail.com or post in the manga mavericks tread on animation revelation or again tweet at us at manga underscore mavericks on Twitter. And we love hearing your guys' comments. And we love hearing your feedback. And yeah, that does it for this installment of Manga Mavericks at Movies. And we gotta keep digging into this Miyazaki conspiracy. He's gonna hunt us down, man. He's well, gonna hunt us down like like cattle. Yeah, he, they're gonna. He's gonna like tie us up. Uh, on the hands of a giant clock tower, and we're going to get crushed to death like the Duke of Cagliostro. Oh, God. Yeah. We've gone too far. We've gone too far. I contend we haven't gone far enough, and we'll see why when we dig into the, how the conspiracy develops in... Nausicaa? Nausicaa. How it develops in Nausicaa. <laughs> It's very... I'm very tired. I've had a long day. Yeah, it's, it's very like, late. Right now, it's like 11 p.m. Yes. I still have homework to do. Yeah, so sayonara. Later. If we're still alive.